Hi, everyone. This is Dan Linna. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Law Technology Now on the Legal Talk Network. Today, we're speaking to my Northwestern Pritzker School of Law colleague, Laura Nyrider. It's March 24th, and we're practicing social distancing, so Laura joined us by phone. We think the episode turned out pretty well, and we hope you enjoy it. And I hope that you and your family are safe and healthy. Take care. Hello, this is Dan Linna. Welcome to Law Technology Now on the Legal Talk Network. My guest today is Laura Nyrider. Laura is Clinical Associate Professor of Law and Co-Director of the Center on Wrongful Convictions at Northwestern Pritzker School of Law. You might know Laura for a representation of Brendan Dassey, whose case was profiled in the Netflix series, Making a Murderer. More recently, Laura and our Northwestern colleague, Steve Drizzen, released a new series of podcasts, Wrongful Conviction, False Confessions, which has been ranked as high as number three in the United States. Today, we'll talk about Making a Murderer and Laura's wrongful convictions work with a focus on lawyering in the age of social media. Laura, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me, Dan. It's my pleasure. Great. I can't wait to dive into the conversation. But before we get started, we want to thank our sponsors. Thank you to our sponsor, Logical, instant discovery software for modern legal teams. Logical offers perfectly predictable pricing at just $250 per matter per month. Create your free account anytime at logical.com slash LTN. That's logic with a K, C-U-L-L dot com forward slash L-T-N. We also want to thank our sponsor, Headnote. Headnote helps lawyers get paid faster with their compliant e-payments and accounts receivables automation platform. To learn how to get paid quicker and more efficiently, visit them at headnote.com. That's headnote.com. Laura, I'm so glad you're able to join us. Uh, Can we just jump in and talk a little bit about, uh, you know, tell our audience about the work you're doing as the co-director of the Center on Wrongful Convictions at Northwestern? Yeah, the Center on Wrongful Convictions is one of the nation's oldest innocence project type organizations. We're 20 years old now. And over those 20 years, our faculty and students have exonerated more than 40 innocent men, women, and children and contributed to the release of dozens more, which I am so proud to say makes us one of the most successful innocence organizations in the country too. You know, the CWC has an incredible history that long predates when I joined it, right, the CWC first uh, built its reputation when it it helped exonerate six people off Illinois' death row, which contributed to the abolition of the death penalty here in Illinois, which was announced at Northwestern Law School. Since then, the CWC has become focused, not exclusively, but focused on the problem of false confessions. We house some of the nation's leading experts on false confessions and police interrogations, And we're at the forefront of a number of conversations, scholarly, research, legal, and public around wrongful convictions, false confessions, and how to make these injustices right. Well, you know, I think a lot of our listeners might not, when someone hears that someone's a law professor, they might not understand how the clinical side works and the kind of stuff you do day-to-day lawyer. I mean, what are the things you really spend your time doing uh, when you're representing clients in this space? Sure. Well, there's two kinds of law professors, right? Both absolutely vital to the legal education experience. And this is true of many law schools. There's the straight doctrinal side, which are usually lectures or seminars that students take. And then a lot of law schools have clinics, which are basically law firms that operate out of the law school. And these clinics can have all kinds of different specialties, right? In Northwestern, we have everything from environmental law to juvenile justice, to civil rights, to entrepreneurship law, to wrongful convictions. And the Center of Unwrongful Convictions is part of our clinic. We get about 3,500 letters every year from inmates around the country asking us to look into their claims of innocence. And there are about five lawyers on our staff and a wonderful team of about 20 law students, give or take, every semester. So we call through these cases the best we can with our partners in the private sector, of course, at private law firms. And we take the cases where we think we can make a real difference, not only exonerate clients, but we also think about changing the law. We try to pick cases that will elevate important areas of the law that need to be looked at differently. Maybe there's a lot of potential for reform. And we take these stories that our clients have lived through, right? Sometimes 
10 years behind bars, sometimes 15 years behind bars, sometimes 30 years behind bars for crimes they definitely did not commit. We take their stories and we do our best to shout them from the mountaintop all over media, all over social media, because we're in such a moment. People around the country, around the globe, are listening to these stories of injustice and want to make a difference want to change the system. So there's no better time to be doing this work and to be talking about it than right now. Yeah, that's great. Well, and I want to get into the media and the social media piece of that, but just to kind of follow up on that, I mean, what do you think is the best estimate of the scope of the wrongful convictions problem? I think we all kind of, lots of people kind of tend to think, well, this couldn't happen to me or it's a limited problem. But I mean, how many people are wrongfully convicted each year in the US? How many, how many people do we think are currently in prison on wrongful convictions? Well, you know, we don't have perfect data on that because this kind of information is not tracked. There are probably maybe close to a thousand lawyers in the country who do this work, and that's it. So, and of course, the work is all done pro bono, or most of it is done pro bono. So, we don't have a strong sense of the scope of the problem of wrongful convictions simply because we don't, we only know about those cases that we find right? Mm -hmm. There's no overall sort of survey mechanism here. We do know that there have been over 2,000 exonerations, right? There's a national registry of exonerations that's hosted by the University of Michigan and UCAL Irvine. We know that there are hundreds of false confession cases, which is my own specialty. We know that kids, if you look into that data set, are between two and three times as likely to falsely confess as adults. But in terms of getting a handle on the overall problem, you know, that's, that's a real challenge. Yeah. Well, tell us a little bit about, about your representation of Brenda Dassey. And, and I mean, how did that come about? And, <laughs> and then also then your appearance on the Netflix series, Making a Murderer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is a fascinating story because it's a story very much about legal education and the power that it can have on students. So let's see, it was about 13 years ago. I was a law student then at Northwestern. And I was in my third year of law school, and I had my life planned out. I was going to be a corporate litigator. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, I had a, a job lined up after graduation. Everything was smooth. And on a complete whim, during my third year of law school, I decided to sign up for the Center on Wrongful Convictions clinical class, which at the time was taught by Steve Drizzen. This is a complete gambit, right? I had no pre-existing knowledge of, of criminal law besides 1L Basics. I had no pre-existing knowledge of wrongful convictions or false confessions. And I walk into the class, and within about, oh gosh, two or three weeks, Steve, then my professor, called me into his office. Because you see, this was about four months after Brendan Dassey had been convicted in Wisconsin of helping his uncle rape and murder a young woman named Teresa Halbach. Steve called me into his office. I guess I was the nearest available student And he said, I've just gotten involved in this case out of Wisconsin involving a 16-year-old boy with intellectual disabilities who confessed to a crime that I don't think he committed. And he handed me the interrogation videos of Brendan Dassey. And he told me to go home and watch them. So I go home. I sit down on my couch. I get out my laptop. I pop in these these DVDs, right, because this is 13 years ago, and uh, and I watched them, right, all these hours from start to finish. And my heart broke because I saw two adult police officers manipulating a frightened 16-year-old boy into confessing to a murder that he couldn't even describe. And that was a transformative moment for me. I could not walk away. So I graduated and had the good fortune of, after about six months in the private sector, being able to come back to Northwestern and work alongside Steve to build the Center on Wrongful Convictions and to represent Brendan and other kids just like him ever since. And so how in that process did it come up then that this opportunity to appear on uh, Making a Murderer, (laughs) I mean, how did that enter into the whole, whole equation? Well, that's the crazy thing. So we took this case, right? I graduated, I came back, we took this case and um, had no idea at the time that anybody wanted to make a movie about this case at all. It wasn't until two years later, really three years later, in 2010, we go up to Manitowoc, Wisconsin 
for Brendan's post-conviction hearing, right? It's January, it's northern Wisconsin, it's snowing like crazy. We're in court for this five-day hearing with our students doing our thing. And on day two, we notice that there are two women in parkas standing off to the side in the courtroom filming everything we're doing with a handheld camcorder. And we walked over to them and kind of said, well, what are you guys doing? (laughs) Mm -hmm. And it turns out this was Laura Ricciardi and Moira Demos. They told us they wanted to make a movie about this case. Now, you have to understand Moira was still in graduate school, right? She was still a student. And Laura Ricciardi was a lawyer by day. This was her sort of side hustle. They never made a movie before. They're there with their handheld camcorder. And we looked at them and we said, you know what, guys? That's cool. Mm -hmm. Good luck to you. And we figured we would never hear from them again. Right? Mm -hmm. So, and for a while we didn't, right? That was 2010. The years go by, 2011, 2012, 2013, 14, 15. Right? And somewhere in there, Netflix is invented, by the way. Mm Mm-hmm. They call us in 2015 and they say, well, Netflix has picked up our show, turned it into a 10-hour series. It's going to be released around the globe. And we were still like, well, you know, Netflix is kind of new. Nobody really knows what this is. You know, that's great. Congratulations. But maybe nobody will watch it, right? Eh, Who knows what's going to happen? So December 18th, 2015 rolls around the day it's released. It's released and goes viral. I mean, it goes global, right? Within the first Mm -hmm. two weeks, 20 million people watched the show. And that's just in the United States alone. And all of a sudden, our phones are ringing off the hook. Our DMs are filled with messages. Our email is flooded. People are showing up at our office. You know, I mean, it's absolutely insane. The letters are coming in through the mail. And the world is going crazy. Reporters are calling from across the globe, New Zealand, UK, (laughs) US. And the whole time, the whole time, I'm just sitting there looking at the TV screen going, oh my God, why didn't I brush my hair for that interview? (laughs) 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 It was completely unexpected, completely unforeseen. But my God, what a blessing it's been, right, for Brendan. Because Brendan, like so many of our clients, was a forgotten person for a decade. Hmm. And suddenly the show comes out, it tells his story, shouts it from the rooftops. People around the globe hear it and understand it and empathize with it and are moved by it and are bothered by it. And they start tweeting and posting on Facebook and talking to their neighbors and writing to their lawmakers. And suddenly the world is saying Brendan Dassey's name. It's an incredible thing. And you know what else, Dan? You know what else people did? They started writing to him. Mm-hmm. To this day, Brendan gets between five and 10 letters every day Wow! from all across the globe. He has a, a notebook where he keeps a list of every city where he's received a letter from. And it's, you know, the six populated continents. It's incredible. He keeps these letters from well-wishers and he writes back to people as much as he can. Um, Those letters give him hope, right? This is a kid who never had many friends before all this happened. Mm -hmm. And now he's got friends across the globe. So those letters, they sustain him. And that, frankly, is what sustains us. Yeah, it is such an interesting story, just as far as the impact on on your specific client, Brendan, but then also the the larger impact. And I mean, this is starting to get into the specific topic I'd like us to delve into a little bit here, because I think it's interesting that in the legal industry, we're a bit reluctant to seek out media. We're reluctant to use social media. Uh, it's interesting in private practice, I would frequently hear people talk about someone who might be successful in their practice. And, and I think people were divided into a couple of different buckets sometimes about, you'd hear people say like, oh, well, so-and-so's good at marketing. And it's like, well, <laughs> (laughs) Actually, 
What's wrong with that? That actually is part of the description. I mean, if people don't know what we do. No doubt about it. Um, business of law, right. Sure, sure. And then, then part of what you're talking about, too, is, is, is not just people knowing who you are and what you're doing, but using it to uh, improve your representation of your client, but then also promote the change you want to see in the world, exactly. promote justice in the world. Right. No, that's exactly right. I mean, there is a sort of allergy in the profession to, to media and to publicity. It's something I think about all the time. Right, because of course lawyers have this ethos, um, and of course ethical obligations around confidentiality, discretion, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right, trustworthiness, all of these things, and those are core values of the profession. But there's a moment that we're in now, especially for people who don't have the ability to access media. You know, people who don't have their own PR team, right, or, or clients who don't have their own PR team. We're in a moment now where people are paying attention to these cases like never before. And they're able to join a participatory conversation about things they see and perceive to be injustice. And more than that, they want to get involved. They want to make change. It's incredible. You know, millions of people around the globe have participated in one way or another in our campaign to free Brendan Dassey. And so it's an incredible thing from a lawyering perspective. We have this sort of traditional ethos of discretion, right, of tight-lippedness. And certainly in many, many cases that we handle, that's the watchword. But in a situation like Brendan's, of, you know, a bit of a unique case, but increasingly less unique as we move forward. As his lawyer, you ask yourself, what do you do when the law doesn't recognize what happened to Brendan as wrong, but 50 million people around the globe do, mm -hmm. right? As his advocate, what do you do with that? Do you ignore it or do you try to use it? Are you bound in fact to use it for your client's benefit? And those are the, the questions that keep me up at night. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, what do you think on that point? I mean, to what extent do you consider yourself obligated to keep communicating with people on social media, keep building your following so that you have this tool to, to help your clients and help the cause. Well, it's, not, it's, you know, it's, a, it's a delicate dance, right? I think about this every time I send out a tweet, every time I post on Instagram, I think about balancing my obligations to all of my clients in terms of confidentiality with the fact that people want to get behind these cases now. And it's interesting, if you look back over the history of wrongful conviction cases, you know, Brendan's is not the first that has benefited from a sort of mass awareness of injustice, right? There was the West Memphis Three case, which the CWC was also closely involved in, a very, very famous case that attracted a lot of celebrity involvement after a few documentaries were made about it. This is a 1993 triple murder from Arkansas that was made quite famous in a series of HBO documentaries. We were involved in that case too, and that was pre-social media, right? The, the three convicted defendants in the West Memphis Three case were exonerated in 2011, so right before the world changed. And it's interesting to me to have lived through that case and been part of that legal team, because I saw, you know, celebrities were flocking to that case. People around the world were sending postcards in, you know, doing whatever we all did before social media to voice our support. Sort of see the power of a mass movement here. And now, of course, I'm living it again in the age of social media and seeing people hunger information about Brendan, hunger for solutions, ways we can stop this from happening. And I do feel an obligation on the part of Brendan, while observing confidentiality, while acting with, with all, the, all the discretion that the profession demands, I do feel an obligation to keep people informed, keep people engaged around his case, around the issues. Um, I think, you know, in a way, the Center on Wrongful Convictions has become rather uniquely situated here. We've ridden this wave of social media and, and sort of digital new media interest in these cases in a way that almost nobody else has. And, um, you know, we're feeling our way, but I hope doing it responsibly and doing it well. 
Well, we've talked about this before, you've mentioned, and I agree completely about the the possibility of getting more people engaged in this discussion about justice. I mean, uh, we're talking mostly in the criminal space, but even when you think about civil justice, the, the number of people who don't have access to law, legal services, courts, I mean, it, it's really appalling here in the U.S. And, and, and to what extent, I guess, can we use social media to get more people engaged in these broader discussions about, about what justice in society and, and the legal institutions, the rule of law? Oh, it's vital. I mean, those discussions are happening out there, right? Whether or not lawyers are involved, they're happening on social media because it's not just Brendan. It's not just any of our individual clients who are experiencing these problems, right? People experience injustice, senses of powerlessness, um, senses that the system is broken in a thousand different ways in their life. And they're out there on social media talking about it, right? People have had bad experiences with the court system. People may, maybe have had bad experiences with law enforcement or defense attorneys. People who have felt that sense of powerlessness suddenly have a platform. All of us on the planet now have a platform on social media to talk about it. And people are talking about it. It's happening. So the question is, what do lawyers do about that? Right? What do lawyers do about the fact that all of a sudden, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of voices in their different ways are talking about injustice and fixing the system? We can either cling to these old ideals of, well, I never go out in public, I never engage, or we can think about engaging in a responsible, strategic, thoughtful way that furthers the conversation and that makes real change. Yeah, I think another piece of that that's happening too is is we're seeing, uh, at least in the pockets I'm looking at, a little bit more transparency in the courts. And um, and just one example of that is is in Michigan, Chief Justice Bridget McCormick. Uh, she's active on 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 Twitter and trying to you know she streaming is. more of their yes. arguments and things like that. And uh, I mean, that's just one example of ways in which we can invite more people in to learn about the law and 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 our justice systems, things like that. Well, it's interesting you bring her up because, of course, she, before she was on the high court in Michigan, her early life was at the Michigan Innocence Project, mm -hmm. right? So she did exactly mm -hmm. yeah, the same yeah. kind of work that we do here at the Center on Wrongful Convictions, uh, just at the University of Michigan School of Law. You know, mm -hmm. there's something about this work in particular because the stories that come out of it are so incredible, that lends itself to thinking broadly, I think, about engaging with the media. And yes, Justice McCormick has done a tremendous job of translating that awareness of, you know, engaging with people, telling stories, being responsible, being transparent, um, being communicative. You know, she's translated that brilliantly to the judiciary. Yeah. Well, you know, so we've been mostly talking about access to justice and and uh, wrongful convictions, but you did spend some time working as a, a commercial litigator at Sidley Austin, and you know, just even based on that experience and your other connections to to private legal practice, what would you think are the benefits or the ways in which lawyers at big law firms should be thinking about how they might make effective use of social media? Yeah, it's a very good question, right? I mean, a lot of folks at big law firms have clients, big corporate clients who have their own PR team, their own marketing team. So people who are thinking about social media and the need to respond independently, right? I think that lawyers need to be intimately involved in those conversations, particularly in high profile cases, right? Think about if the Enron case happened today, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you've got Enron's PR team, but you also need to be, I think lawyers need to be engaging in that message because if that case happened today, you would have millions of people on Instagram and on Twitter talking about your client, probably trashing your client, right? Yeah. And is it, does it become in that context part of a lawyer's job to think about that, to work with the PR team, to manage those conversations as best you can as a method of advocacy for your client? I mean, bear in mind, of course, in the criminal space, we know that about 95% of cases result in guilty pleas, are resolved by guilty plea which is a huge problem. And of course, in the civil arena, most cases are settled as well. So those conversations, right, if Enron's getting dragged through the mud on social media or whatever clients getting dragged through the mud on social media, that's going to influence your client's willingness to settle or to plead guilty in the criminal context, right? Just to end those conversations, to sort of staunch the bleeding. The public face, the public conversations that are happening on social media, lawyers can't ignore them. 
we have to figure out how to engage with them. And in some cases, I think we have an obligation to. Yeah. Well, I'd like to talk with you a little bit about how we can, in law schools, train students to use social media effectively. I also want to chat a little bit about your new podcast with Steve Drizzen, and, and then also about law and technology and, and how that might help in the wrongful conviction space and, and um, hopefully preventing wrongful convictions from occurring. But before we do that, before we continue our interview with Laura and I, Ryder, we're going to take a quick break to hear a message from our sponsor. Trying to cut costs? You're not alone. In today's climate, a five-figure e-discovery bill per month is steep. Don't pay that. Use Logical to reduce expense and control your discovery process. Get started today for only $250 per matter, and they'll waive migration costs from competing platforms. For more information, visit Logical.com LTN. That's Logic with a K, C-U-L-L dot com forward slash L-T-N. Hey, law firms, getting paid is fantastic, but dealing with accounts receivable is such a pain. What if there was a better way? Enter Headnote, an industry-leading compliant e-payments and AR automation system. Their unique blend of features cuts through the noise and helps you get paid 70% faster. Skip the paper checks, spreadsheets, and awkward calls due to overdue clients. Get paid faster with less effort. Visit headnote.com for more information. And we're back. Thank you for joining us. We're with Laura Nyrider, who you may know from the Netflix series Making a Murderer and her new podcast series, Wrongful Conviction, False Confessions. Laura, before the break, we were talking about the benefits of lawyers uh, making good use of social media. I mean, how, do, how might we in law schools train students to use social media effectively? Well, I have a feeling that our students can probably train us how to use social media effectively, right? I mean, this generation now, the students mm-hmm. that we're just starting to see are the students who really grew up immersed in the space. So I think that it's a two-way street. Um, mm-hmm. You know, to, I've learned a lot from my students, frankly, as I've navigated first Twitter and now Instagram. You know, it's easy, I think, for folks to write off at first, people who didn't mm-hmm. grow up in the age of social media but they're incredibly potent tools. So I would actually sort of push back on that and say, you know what, it's a a two-way conversation. We can learn from our students the ins and outs of how social media works, how to spread a message, how to hashtag, how to at, you know, (laughs) all those things. I think what we can teach them in return is the ethos of leadership Mm -hmm. that I hope they carry into their professions, you know, whatever type of lawyering they may end up doing. The idea that, yeah, lawyers have an obligation to participate in these conversations that are happening out there, whether they're about, you know, criminal justice, civil injustice, access to justice, you know, the law in general, right? Whatever it may be, legal institutions, um, those conversations are happening and lawyers need to be a part of them. It's part of being a leader. It's part of being a forward thinker. So that's what I think we can impart to our students and then sit down and let them show us what an Instagram story is. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I mean, so maybe maybe it's less thinking about training the law students, and maybe it has more to do with getting our colleagues to see the the potential value. And many of our colleagues actually are using social yes. media and finding a yes, way to increasingly so. Mm-hmm. Yes, so I think that's important. And I, you know, from the people that I follow, at least on Twitter, mm-hmm. um, I can see a huge benefit from that. These fascinating conversations that are happening online, people are getting a lot of engagements from other people in the profession. I think that's wonderful. So I I think for those who have joined it, it's been a positive experience. We just need more people to to take the plunge. I was very skeptical at first, Uh right? I only joined social media a few years ago. You know, I was never a Facebook person. I'm still not on Facebook. (laughs) I always sort of thought like, well, you know, that's sort of self-absorbed. You're just posting Uh a bunch of photos, Uh whatever, you know, even though that's, that's like how the world works now. So I've never been on Facebook. So my introduction to social media was first Twitter. And now I'm building a following on Instagram, which is its whole, a whole nother level of new ways to think about communication. Um, but I've worked a lot with social media specialists across the country. And, and this is where the conversations are happening, right? And we can either say, well, I've never done that before, so I'm not going to participate. Or we can do it. Take the plunge. Listen to the conversations. 
learn how these conversations are being said now because it's the future. It's here, whether we like it or not. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, and I think the other thing that we sometimes don't give enough credit for these these other mediums, well, you talked about leadership and how important that is, but the communication. And I think sometimes the way we do things, sometimes in classes or even when we're out practicing, we tend to think that people are going to give us their undivided attention for a really long time. And thinking about how to effectively, clearly get people's attention and make it clear why, well, like even when you're making an argument to a judge, right? Sometimes we think like, oh, well, I've got a 15 minute hearing or this or that. And when you start practicing, you learn that you better be really like, if you don't have the judge's attention within 15, 20 seconds or something like that, it's all over. Yeah. (laughs) It's all over. Slink out the back door. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Well, and so so thinking about how to communicate effectively on social media, and it has nothing to do with declining attention time, I don't think, maybe something, right? But I, I think oftentimes we don't think about how to communicate that way in the work that we do as lawyers, and it can help us improve our communication there as well. Well, there's no doubt about it. I mean, there's nothing like staring down the barrel of 280 characters to teach you how to be uh, concise, right? Yes. <laughs> I mean, yeah, exactly. Which, which is true. I struggled greatly with that at first, and I'm sure I have a lot of improvement yet to do, But but there is a... Um, so there's a real challenge there, right? I'm used to writing legal briefs. I'm used to writing introductory paragraphs. I'm used to writing all these things. Now it's just, boom, make your points. And I like to think that's honed, actually, my thinking, my ability to deliver a message. Instagram is its whole new thing, right? This is something I just joined not even a year ago. And the medium, of course, is visual. And that's going to surpass Twitter. It will overtake Twitter. So mm-hmm. if it hasn't already in terms of mm-hmm. people who are involved and just the influence that it has in the daily conversations that people are having. So they're translating those, you know, 280 character tweets into a visual medium is its own challenge. But it's honestly, it's, it's fun. It's a fun challenge. And the results that I see from engagement from people who are willing to, you know, continue this conversation and work with us to make change in the system, it's incredibly valuable. Just shift gears a second here, and then I want to talk about law and technology uh, in this space. But you started a, a podcast series with Steve Drizzen, our colleague at Northwestern, Wrongful Conviction, False Confessions. How did that come about? Well, um, that came about, of course, Steve and I, first Steve and now now me as well, we have special expertise in the problem of false confessions. We're two of the lawyers in the country with the greatest amount of experience and expertise in this particular strange little a fascinating little problem. And over the years, we've accumulated a great deal, a great number of videos from real interrogations where you can watch a person who has been exonerated, right, a definitely innocent person, be questioned until they break and confess to a crime they didn't commit, usually a very, very serious crime. So we have this incredible library of videos, different cases that we've worked on, different cases that we've consulted on. These videos come to us all different ways. And we just thought, you know what? The world was lit on fire by making a murderer, by seeing what happened to Brendan. You know, I've traveled the globe, Dan, talking about false confessions Mm -hmm. after making a murderer. Everywhere I go, right? Australia, New Zealand, UK, South America, Europe, Denmark, everywhere around the US, people say, I can't believe that's legal. How is that legal? How is that allowed? Right? And I just kept thinking to myself, God, you guys, I love that you're feeling this for Brendan. Those are the right instincts, right? But it happens all the time. It's not just Brendan. It's not just a Wisconsin thing, right? This is a problem around the United States and really around the globe. The episode we're dropping this week is a story from New Zealand that is remarkably similar to Brendan's story. So that's that's how the idea for the podcast was born. This idea that, you know, if this case caught people's imagination, made them feel fired up, made them want to get involved, I mean, we have plenty more stories like that that need to be told. People need to understand this isn't just one locality's problem. It's a huge problem worldwide that needs to be fixed. Yeah, well, one of the things I'd like to chat about is, is how we might use innovation and technology in this space. And, and we've talked about this a little bit before, 
you know, maybe, maybe there's ways that technology could be used to, if you're spending lots of time reviewing these videos, of false confessions and audio recordings, perhaps you, you receive this deluge of, I think you said 3,500 letters a year. Might there be ways to use technology to help with that? Uh, to what extent will capturing data and data analytics start impacting future practice in this space? I mean, I don't know. From, I mean, what are your pain points? Where do you think some of the things that we're doing in connection with our law and technology initiative here at Northwestern, for example, how might some of those things help you in the stuff that you're doing as a lawyer in this space? Well, I think analytics are, you know, that's something I use a lot in the social media space, right? I love finding out who cares about these issues, who's benefiting from these conversations, who's leading these conversations. You know, I think that's all, that's where I spend most of my time with analytics right now is plumbing, plumbing my social media accounts and, and related social media accounts. But it's interesting, right? I mean, yes, we've talked about how technology can be used in the wrongful conviction space. And I'm sure, I'm quite sure that there are many, many ways to do that. But it's interesting in this space, and I think you've sensed this when we've talked about it before, you know, there is, for me, a sort of mental hurdle to get over, which is these cases of just like profound injustice usually happen when a system treated my clients like a cog on a conveyor belt, right? When there was not enough mm -hmm. humanity brought to the system. And so the idea of sort of, you know, using tech to seek further justice, I'm quite sure that there are ways to do that, but there's an interesting sort of discord there in my mind that mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think needs to be plumbed and figured out because it's sort of like, you feel like you're, you're making a system less human when in fact it's already terribly inhumane. That said, right, we need good data. We need good data about how many people are being interrogated. We need, like you started this conversation out, we need information about how often wrongful convictions happen. We need information about the false confession rate. We need information about eyewitness misidentification rate and on and on and on, right? That's just in the small wrongful conviction context versus the whole criminal justice context. So it's an interesting line to walk, right? Because there's a sense of inhumanity that pervades the criminal justice system. The other thing that I think about a lot vis-a-vis -vis tech in this space, you know, my husband's a, a general counsel, right? And he, so he does, he happens to work at a business that has a high volume of litigation that it's involved in. And I can see very clearly in that context, how data and tech, you know, looking back at his company's history of resolving cases, how that would guide him in resolving future cases. I can see that very clearly. But when I try to apply that thinking to my space, I think, well, the data that we have, to the extent we have it, about the functioning of the criminal justice system is not data that I want to replicate or learn from in any way. It's data that I want to change, right? I mean, the, the criminal justice system has a deep history of systemic racism, systemic inequality, problems, as you've said, with access to justice. These are not data points I want to learn from and duplicate. These are problems I want to erase. So that's an interest. So it's, I say these things just because it's two tweaks in my mind mm -hmm, about mm -hmm. the conversation around law and tech. That said, we need data. We need to know what's happening because you can't really make change until you first know what things look like. So those are sort of yeah. my you know, unformed thoughts, I guess, yeah, yeah, yeah. about law and tech in this space. There's interesting, important conversations to have with a couple of maybe cultural adaptations to recognize that this is a space already saturated with history we don't want to repeat and um, a deep sense of inhumanity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think those are really important concerns and they come up all over in this space. And so thinking about how can we use improved processes or design thinking and then use technology in ways that would allow the system to be more humane, to allow humans to do the things where the greatest value is added. I think one of the things that when we talked uh, considered pain points before, this idea of having to review hours of videos and audio recordings and just trying to think about, well, you know, what if someone is tasked with with doing that? What if could you create tools that could help notice things like body posture or particular questions that are asked, things like that that might make it easier to make sure something's not missed or to focus on something? Or I would guess there are times when um, someone is forced to file a motion in this space when there just simply isn't enough time 
to review the videos like you would like, for example. And maybe there's a way technology could help with a task like that even, perhaps. Yeah, you know, it may be. It's it's interesting because I think what we're really circling around is the fact that there are ways tech can no doubt help streamline some of these processes, but it's also, you know, pushing against this cultural, you know, amongst the best defense circles, right? Leading defense attorneys. I think there's a, a cultural resistance mm -hmm. to that idea because again, the client, your client has been so dehumanized by the system. Mm -hmm. I would feel sort of, you know, a, a very acute pang of conscience if I didn't sit down and watch those videos myself. But so it's an interesting thing to think about because you're quite right, but there's a cultural bridge there, a dialogue to, to have about how to make that work in a way that comports with what we sort of tell ourselves our lawyering obligations are. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and maybe it wouldn't replace like actually watching it. It'd be like kind of like spell check, right? Like word puts a little squiggly line under a word and says, Hey, you should take another look at this. And I've, I've certainly filed motions where I say, you know what, in these interrogation videos, the client denies having done this 650 times mm -hmm. before confessing. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, those kinds mm -hmm. of points, yeah, not every case, yeah. but when you can make those kinds of data-driven points, that's persuasive, right? It really is. Yeah, yeah. Well, we should keep talking about that, but I think the, the, another thing then related to this is like thinking about all this great work that you're doing once the problem has already happened, the wrongful conviction has already happened. I mean, what kind of things can we be doing? I mean, you're advocating um, where you have people who are in positions of power to make change, what kind of things need to be done to prevent wrongful convictions altogether, whether it's changes in the design of systems or, well, where do you think that, that and that's a really broad question that kind of like goes to some people's life's work, but. Um, yeah, it does. It does, but it's the right question to ask, right? Because we can tell these stories, we can represent our individual clients, mm -hmm. but if we don't learn from them and make change, you know, that's the whole mm -hmm. point of everything that it is we're doing with representing our clients, with, with housing this work at a law school where people think deeply about the legal system, right? And certainly with talking about it on social media too. So our center, uh, and me and Steve in particular, we've been very focused on driving reform, on actually creating changes in the law that flow from the sort of global interest suddenly in wrongful convictions and criminal justice reform. So we've been involved in efforts in two states, successful efforts in two states, Illinois and California, to require lawyers for kids, certain kids at least, in the interrogation room, right? These laws are brand new. They're post-making a murderer. Um, in at least one case, one of the two states, they were inspired by making a murderer um, because parents, you know, they don't realize it's only in about 13 or 14 states that police are required to notify parents before questioning their children. Mm -hmm. In most states, there's no requirement like that at all. And as a mom myself, I find that deeply disturbing, not to mention as a lawyer. So we've been working on that in two states. Another huge reform that we've been working on and many, many others as well is the simple requirement that interrogations are recorded electronically, right? Videotaped. Mm -hmm. When I started doing this work about 10 or 15 years ago, not many states required it, maybe five or 10, right? Now that number is up to 26 due to our advocacy and the advocacy of many, many partners around the country, Innocence Project, private law firms, um, Jenner and Block led the way on this actually, and a lot of partners like that, but still only 26 states require interrogations to be recorded, which obviously means that 24 states don't require this. So in 24 states still, the kinds of things that shocked the world when they saw them happening on Making a Murderer, the kinds of things that we talk about in our podcast when we play our interrogation videos for people and tell people the stories of these cases, in 24 states we have no record. Still, the door to the interrogation room remains closed, right? So that's a, that's a huge push there as well, simply for transparency, right? Um, and then there's other exciting change in New York. In the last six months, there was a bill introduced to ban deception in the interrogation room. Most people don't know that it is perfectly legal for police to lie yeah, about the yeah. evidence inside the mm -hmm. interrogation room. So they can say things like, you know, we found your DNA at the scene, we found mm -hmm. your fingerprints on the gun, even if that's not true, right? And use that as a pressure point to secure a confession. New York is the first state where a bill to ban that has been introduced 
And that was inspired directly by the Netflix series When They See Us about the Central Park jogger case and the social media uprising that followed that series. So it's, it's another interesting and perfect example of how this groundswell of outrage that you see on social media, of reaction, of empathy, of wanting to get involved can lead directly to change. Well, what would you say to people who are listening and they say, I want to contribute? We have a lot of lawyers who are listening to this show and they want to contribute to seeing some of these changes. I think an example I see in, my, in the law and technology space is that there's a lot of concern about the ways in which algorithms are being used in the criminal justice system. And there was a mm -hmm. lot of outrage about the Loomis decision, for example, in Wisconsin, which I understand on one hand, but then on the other hand, it's like most of the people who are outraged are in a position to have influence to say, well, let's change the rules. Let's change the rules of criminal procedure. Let's require exactly. that this can't, it can't be done this way. And, and, but yet I haven't seen a lot of mobilization to do that. A little bit different in the space you're talking about. There are a lot of other people you'd have to engage and get them mobilized to change. But I mean, what have we learned? Like what are the most effective things that people could be doing that you think would be, would be most likely to um, cause change to happen? Yeah, well, there's any number of things, right? I mean, if you're interested in, in this kind of work and these kinds of stories, there are a thousand different ways you can educate yourself about wrongful convictions, about criminal justice reform, or whatever thing it is you think in the legal system needs to be changed, right? There are books, there are films, there are documentary series. So get out there and get educated. And once you've done that, get on social media and see who's talking about it. Because if it bothers you, I guarantee it's bothered others. And those conversations are the beginning, can be at least the beginning of real movements. You build a following on social media, you build a conversation on social media, you get organizations who are active in whatever space it is you care about to participate in those conversations, to add value to those conversations. Pretty soon, you've got a real coalition on your hands of people who care about your issue, who want to make change around your issue. And then, you know, you've got something to work with. You've got a huge team, I hope, a growing team of people who will keep the conversation happening, who won't let it die, who have networks of their own that they can bring to the table. You know, that's how every single one of these movements starts. It's just a question of going out there and getting engaged. Laura, it's been great talking with you. Uh, can you tell our listeners if they want to go tune into your, your podcast with Steve Drizzen, how can they find that? Sure. Our podcast, Wrongful Conviction, False Confessions, is available pretty much everywhere you get your podcasts, Apple, Spotify, iHeart, everywhere else. So just Google us and you'll be sure to find us. Let me know what you think, by the way. I am on Twitter at Laura Nyrider and I'm on Instagram at Laura Nyrider. So I'd love to hear from people. Yeah, I've been listening. I love the podcast. I love all the work that you and Steve are doing. I mean, th thank you for the, all that you're doing and thank you for joining us on Law Technology Now. Well, right back at you. This is a great podcast too. Thanks so much for having me on. Thank you, Laura. And thank you to our listeners. This has been another edition of Law Technology Now on the Legal Talk Network. Please take a minute to subscribe and rate us in Apple Podcasts and Google Podcasts. And you can find me on Twitter at Dan Linna. Please follow me, retweet links to this episode, and join the legal innovation and technology discussion online. And join us next time for another edition of Law Technology Now. I'm Dan Linna, signing off. If you'd like more information about what you've heard today, please visit LegalTalkNetwork.com. Subscribe via iTunes and RSS, find us on Twitter and Facebook, or download our free Legal Talk Network app in Google Play and iTunes. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, Legal Talk Network, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, and subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer.